Premier Media's Mining Weekly is interviewing Edward Stirk, the Director of Research of the World Platinum Investment Council, which has just published its latest Platinum Quarterly. Dealing with the first three months of this year, as well as a revised forecast for 2023. Ed, it's great to chat to you again. Your research indicates that overall first quarter supply remained constrained and is forecast to remain flat for the full year. What are the downside risks to mine supply in 2023? And what are the other risks to supply? So look, I mean, I think there are a number of challenges facing um, mine supply at the moment. Um, in South Africa specifically, obviously, there's the electricity shortage. Um, and then more broadly, uh, there have been some operational difficulties at some operations in, in North America, including uh, some damage to a shaft at an operation in Montana. Um, and then in Russia, obviously, uh, Nor Nickel there is having to try and navigate its way through the... Uh, the headwinds posed by Western enacted sanctions against Russia. Um, so in terms of the downside risk, I think it's important to emphasize that the projections that we put out for 2023 in terms of mine supply, you know, do include an element of those challenges. So they, they are, if you aggregate guidance, they are towards the bottom end of the aggregate guidance range that's published uh, you know, publicly by all of the companies involved. Um, uh, but that said, you know, if, for example, the power uh, shortage in South Africa continues to worsen and um, accelerates through the winter months, which are obviously the period for peak electricity demand uh, in South Africa, then then yes, there are further uh, potential risks to the downside. I guess kind of you know, if wanted to quantify that, what the producers have said publicly, depending upon the producer, is um, a worsening of the power shortage could uh, reduce output by anywhere between five and fifteen percent. So, you know, potentially. Uh, uh, several hundred thousand ounces uh, lower than than currently projected. And what is drawing investors back to platinum? And to what extent will the recessionary environment help or hinder the return of increased platinum investment demand? So I think you can kind of divide investors in two, um, you know, retail investors and then institutional investors. And if we think about the retail investors, uh, you know, they're driven by um, preservation of capital um, during periods of uncertainty. And so, you know, certainly with the banking um, crisis that has enveloped in North, uh, parts of North America and more broadly, you know, that, that has driven a, a certain degree of interest in, in buying platinum bars and coins on the retail side. Um, and that, that uh, buying can be quite material. Um, on the other hand, on the institutional investor side, I think the motivations are a little bit different. So if we think back over the last couple of years, we've seen quite significant outflows from ETFs, and those outflows have been driven by two mm -hmm. factors. Firstly, um, investors in South Africa generally had a preference for the mining equities over the metal, and you know, that was a, a, in expectations of being paid significant dividends by the mining companies, and you know, those expectations certainly came to fruition, and um, it was a, a, arguably a sensible trade there. Um, and then secondly, investors more broadly have been um, looking for yield. So with rising real interest rates, obviously a, a metal ETF is a non-yielding asset. Um, and so uh, investors have been compelled to look elsewhere. But in terms of what's bringing them back, I think you know, within South Africa, obviously the, the challenges facing the mining industry mean that those super dividends may not be quite so super over the next couple of years. And so South African investors have, are uh, arguably... Uh, more interested in the metal for their platinum exposure now than the equities, uh, for the time being at least. Uh, and certainly in the ETF flows, we can see that. We've seen significant flows into the South African ETFs, whilst there has still been outflows from the North American and European ETFs. And I think the other factor at play here, of course, is uh, we're projecting a record deficit of almost a million ounces uh, of platinum this year. And as knowledge of that uh, that projection um, you know, spreads. It's quite possible we'll see the investor interest reverse in Europe and North America as well, mm. and and you know the potential for positive uh, ETF inflows in in those geographies too, which could potentially add uh, to the tightness in the market and and uh, broaden the deficit further. And twenty twenty three is forecast to be a record year for industrial demand for platinum. What are the forces driving this? So there's a couple of things. Um, it's principally being driven by, I guess, some capacity additions in the chemical space in China and also uh, glass capacity additions. 
So we're quite seeing quite a significant year on year increase in industrial demand. Um, now, that said, I should say that industrial demand has grown consistently. It does you know, vary from year to year. But in terms of the CAGR, it's been around 5.2% uh, growth for, since 2010. So consistently growing. And, um, you know, I, I don't see any reason for that uh, pace of growth to change going forwards on average. Um, and then it's also been driven by strong demand uh, from the automotive space. So we're seeing, again, increasing in substitution of platinum for palladium and gasoline vehicles. And then specific to this year, um, the, the emissions legislation has tightened in China, and that means that uh, platinum-containing exhaust treatment systems have, have gained in market share in the heavy-duty and off-road segments. So you know, there's significant growth in demand, both out of the automotive and industrial space. The only area that's a little bit perhaps more challenged is jewellery, which we're forecasting to be down 2% year on year. So let's call it broadly flat. Uh, but effectively within jewellery, we're seeing continued decline in demand from China, despite uh, the COVID reopenings. Um, and that's being offset by growth in the rest of the world, just about, uh, particularly in India, where we're seeing platinum and jewellery actually take um, you know, quite significant strides forward in terms of consumer demand, more shop space dedicated to it, and um, you know, double-digit year-on-year growth for, for the last couple of years now. And automotive demand for platinum has continued to grow. And again, what are the main drivers of this? So, look, as I said, I think it's you know largely that substitution story, but also the the loadings for heavy duty and non road vehicles, and kind of unpacking that in a bit more detail. On the substitution side, the uh, this is substituting platinum for palladium in, in internal combustion engines, and effectively you can substitute them on a one to one basis. So, whilst there's the significant pricing differential between platinum and palladium, the motivation for the automakers to continue to substitute um, remains very much in place. And remember that once the substitution has occurred, it's locked in for the seven year life of um, you know, each vehicle platform because the automakers typically very, very unusual for them. In fact, I think there's only one example we've been able to find where after a model has been certified, uh, an automaker has later on in that model's life gone back and, and recertified it for a different um, ratio of, of platinum, palladium and rhodium in its exhaust treatment system. So, uh, you know, it's pretty much locked in. So even if, if platinum and palladium were to return to par in terms of pricing today, we'd expect the substitution story to continue to run for some time to come. Um, the other thing, of course, in automotive demand is uh, fuel cell electric vehicles. Now, the numbers are very small today, um, but they, they potentially could be more material in the future. And, and on, on our projections, we're expecting fuel cells, uh, electric vehicles to have a roughly 1% market share by 2030. So you know, pretty de minimis in the greater scheme of things. But the platinum demand for that is substantial. So that 1% uh, market share would equate to around a million ounces of platinum demand by 2030, which out of total automotive demand at the moment of around uh, 3.8 million ounces off the top of my head, it's quite a big number. And then getting to green investment, do you expect the green investment case for platinum to strengthen this year? And what will be the factors that do that? So I think it's it's a it's a slow and steady story of a small a small uh, you know starting point that will accelerate in quite dramatically in future years. But certainly, um, you know, we are seeing increasing demand uh, from the hydrogen economy for platinum, and this is uh, both for PEM electrolyzers that uh, produce hydrogen using uh, renewable electricity, and then you know also I touched on fuel cells a minute ago, um, the small but growing number of fuel cell electric vehicles on the road. Um, so in terms of demand. That, that is potentially quite a, a big pull that, that will come from the hydrogen economy in time. But this year, it's in terms of the supply demand dynamics, it's pretty small. That said, if we think about this from an investment point of view, you know, the investor interest in green hydrogen is a key uh, cornerstone, if you like, of um, uh, you know, global decarbonisation, along with many other technologies. Uh, th there are limited opportunities to gain exposure to that. And so in a strange way, even though the numbers this year are quite small, given the market's going to be in a deficit, any small changes or in terms of demand from the new uh, end source of demand can have outside outsized effects on the market. So, you know, the investor interest in platinum as a proxy for green hydrogen, I think is growing and, and um, you know, the getting has become quite meaningful, even though the, the demand might not be there right now in terms of the commodity. And finally, Ed, what in your view should be the main takeaway from this interview? Look, I think the thing to really emphasise is that this is a record deficit. It's almost a million ounces. Um, it's the biggest deficit in our time series. And um, if you look back through uh, you know, other time series that, 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 that go back to the 1970s, it's the biggest deficit in ounce terms, at least. So roughly 12% of demand this year 
has to be met from uh, sources other than mined or recycled platinum. So that means effectively liberating platinum from above ground stocks. And what, what isn't clear to me exactly is what pricing levels are needed in order to attract those ounces into the market. So it could, I think it's, I think we're, we're setting up to be, a, uh, to be looking at a really interesting platinum market through the rest of the year uh, with a record deficit um, and, you know, a need to se secure um, platinum supplies from elsewhere. That was Creamer Media's Mining Weekly. Speaking to Ed Sturk, the Director of Research of the World Platinum Investment Council.